everyone to another episode of Global Insights and Professional Security. I hope you like the jazz intro. My name is Michael Gipps. Um, and as a reminder, this program looks at big themes in security vis-a-vis -vis large societal trends, other industries, and global phenomena, such as digital transformation, law, criminal justice, and disinformation. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Merlin Gilbo to the program. Merlin is the CEO and Executive Director of the Electronic Security Association, which, along with ASAS and SIA, is one of the big three U.S.-based security associations. I met Merlin a couple of years ago when we both spoke on a physical security megatrends panel, and I can attest personally that he knows his stuff. Welcome, Merlin. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, I kind of teased uh, Electronic Security Association. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that and how it differs from SIA, because I think a lot of people see an overlap and um, yes. here it's different. Certainly, great question. And there is some overlap uh, between the two organizations. And, uh, and uh, one of the advantages of that overlap is it allows us to work pretty closely together. Um, so for those who are not familiar with the Electronic Security Association, it started in 1948 as uh, actually the National Burglar and Fire Alarm Association. And it started out of uh, a, a need of, for independent uh, alarm dealers at the time to kind of gather together and be able to purchase supplies that were um, in high demand, but not readily available coming out of World War II. So copper, uh, batteries, things of that nature. And of course, uh, uh, shortly after that, it grew into a, a trade association. So it's been around for uh, quite a while. Uh, we changed our name in 2009 to modernize, uh, uh, obviously, the brand and, uh, and draw more closer to where the, the industry was heading, which is video access control. We've always been strong advocates for intrusion and fire life safety. We still do that. Uh, but certainly with the advent of video surveillance and access control, our members' business has, has grown uh, substantially in, in those uh, areas of discipline. So how we differ uh, from Security Industry Association is they started out as representing manufacturers, uh, and they over time have grown to incorporate uh, and include integration companies as well. Uh, we started out focused on, uh, at the time, alarm dealers and have grown uh, that area to represent the integration community. So uh, we, we allow manufacturers to belong to ESA uh, as well, but our focus is always uh, and always has been and will be uh, the integration community. And we represent companies that are, you know, small operators in a small footprint to, to the big companies that uh, operate on a global level. It's interesting that integrators are a battlefield because I know that having worked for ASS for a long time and their their annual uh, GSX program, that they were in recent years trying to entice integrators and creating integrator tracks. And CEO with ISC West has always served that community last several years or, or more than that has served that community well and I'm, and and ESA also so. Um, the integrators are finding themselves to be a hotly contested community, it seems. Yeah, well, when you think about the integrator, uh, the integrator is kind of that, that point of access to the end user, and it's also an entry point for the manufacturer to the end user. So the manufacturers obviously want to have great relationships with integrators uh, so that their products are being used uh, at the end user level. And, uh, and so they, they're kind of a point of entry for manufacturers and certainly interface quite a bit with the end user community. So there's a lot of synergy between the three organizations as, as you mentioned earlier. So speaking of the three organizations, you know, and beyond, I'm um, pretty active in the association community as well as security community and associations are taking a big hit from COVID. Um, they're, you know, reduced revenue, um, just, you know, just the whole kind of hangover from everything we've been facing for more than a year. How is um, ESA doing? How, in terms of membership, in terms of programming? 
Yeah. So, so no doubt, uh, uh, the association community and not just within our industry, but, uh, globally has, uh, been quite, uh, uh, you know, has been affected by the by the pandemic and primarily due to loss of revenue uh, with from in-person events. Um, from a membership standpoint, we uh, feel very blessed coming out of this uh, uh, year of uh, hunkering down to, uh, to, to, to maintain our membership at a level that uh, we were prior to this. We actually saw interesting growth in new membership in 2020, which uh, surprised us to a certain extent. But, um, you know, I think part of what uh, this uh, time has allowed us to do is to to stop and uh, and take a deep breath and refocus our attention in some areas uh, and, and including resources where they may have been focused in trying to put on uh, you know, in-person events. Now we can redirect some of those resources and focus on building our membership. Uh, uh, you know, growing new members and maintaining the existing members. We certainly saw uh, the loss of some members, uh, some who uh, uh, weren't fortunate enough to make it through the pandemic. Others that saw it as an opportunity to sell their business. Uh, so there's been some transition in that area, but for the most part, we've weathered the storm quite well, and uh, thankfully are uh, are are seeing uh, some momentum here in the first quarter, leading into the second quarter for uh, 2021. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You mentioned in-person events, and that's a real question mark going forward. And for the past few years, even before uh, COVID, and and you know the economic COVID caused recession, there were questions of whether there were too many shows. Now you've got your show, there's ISU West, there's sort of ISC East, there's a GSX show, there's other ASS shows, there's, you know, a lot of other niche shows, there's other global shows like IFSEC and, and Essen. What do you think is going to happen afterwards? Um, is it, are we shrinking down to smaller shows? Are there going to be mergers? Um, is the appetite for in-person diminished? Will it roar back because people have been cramped in their houses for so long? Yeah, good question. I, I think the appetite is there for in-person meetings. In fact, um, uh, we see it, uh, uh, you know, we're in the process of, of uh, producing a virtual event uh, for ESX using a, a platform that's uh, conducive to virtual events, you know, trying to get away from a Zoom or webinar type setting, uh, we're excited about the opportunity to do it. But we also see, and in conversations with exhibitors and sponsors and attendees, we see that the appetite to really get back in person. Our industry, even though it's driven by technology, uh, is really a relationship-driven industry. They want to, they want to touch and feel the products. Uh, they want to have conversations with uh, the vendors. Uh, they want to have conversations with their customers. And while a lot of them pivoted and did some pretty amazing things from a virtual standpoint for sales uh, in, in, the, in the time that we were locked down, uh, they, they still see the value of being on site, in front, speaking one on one with individuals. In terms of too many events, there are a lot of events in this space. We, we really pos position ours kind of as a, a niche type event as well. Uh, it's a very intimate event. It's purely focused on the integration community and the monitoring community. And uh, one of our big drivers is is the peer-to-peer -peer education. So uh, we try to make sure that uh, we're positioning uh, integrators who do things very well on stage and sharing those best practices with uh, other integrators who want to learn from uh, some of the best in, in the industry. So um we we feel like because ours is a smaller event that gives us uh, a good place in the market uh you know for the future um uh, because there you know there may be some lingering aspects and concerns of folks gathering in large crowds for you know maybe another year or two so we're pretty excited uh about our opportunity in 2022 and uh, what is your next show? Is it in 2022? So we're, we're doing a virtual experience June 15th uh, through the 17th. Um, 
for ESX this year. We were scheduled to be in Louisville uh, this year, and uh, in 2022, we'll be in Fort Worth, Texas, oh, nice. uh, in, in the June time frame, early June. Interesting, because um, ISC West, I know, is going to have a major on-site component. Uh, it's in Vegas, as it always is, and but in July. And then ASIS is going to be, I believe, half virtual, half uh, in person in Orlando in September. So when you had to make the decision, you know, I guess it was a few months ago before, you know, and it's sort of, okay, who's going to be vaccinated? What is their, their appetite for travel? So I guess it's a tough decision, right? It was, it was a very difficult decision uh, for all sorts of reasons, financially, um, uh, you know, supporting the community that has supported ESX over the years, supporting our vendors and sponsors. But as I mentioned earlier, being a more intimate uh, event uh, with a smaller attendance compared to a G GSX and a and an ISC West, uh, we just felt like we wanted to make sure we maximized the value that we were providing our sponsors and attendees. Um, and and we knew that even if we tried to do a hybrid event, attendance would be down. And uh, we just felt like for the uh, investment that sponsors make in, in an in-person event with travel, hotel expenses, booth expenses, all the things that it takes to put on an in-person event, we felt like going virtual this year uh, was the right decision. And we tried to do it early enough uh, to where folks could pivot and make decisions. You know, we. We still see many manufacturers in our industry on travel restrictions. So certainly that's going to be a, a big uh, uh, situation that has to get resolved before in-person events can really get back to their full uh, full extent that they were prior to this pandemic. So it was definitely a tough decision. Right. Absolutely. No, that, that makes sense. So for as awful as the pandemic has been, I uh, kind of hate to say it, there have been some good aspects of it, uh, hunkering down and creating new technologies. I think there's going to be like a, a sort of a renaissance of, of great ideas that, that come from all these people sort of being trapped at home. But um, certainly we've seen a lot of, if not innovations, a lot of strong developments in, in tech during COVID. So what do you think, what do you consider to be the biggest advances or innovations um, in electronic security to occur during uh, this past year? Yeah, so anytime we have challenges like we faced this last year, it, you see technology innovation just uh, kind of take off like a rocket. Um, you know, specific to the question, I think one interesting aspect that, that I've kind of kept my eye on is wearable technology. And I know uh, to a certain extent, it might not be specific to security, but it has some value uh, as we move forward, especially in the world of uh, IoT commercial aspect. Um, I see I see the, the advances some of the wearable technology has made, how they're tracking data, how they're using that data uh, to maybe even identify uh, prior to someone uh, uh, exposing other people with uh, uh, contagions, right? So wearable technology certainly was, was pretty exciting. I, I, I don't think you could ask that question without mentioning uh, uh, temperature sensing video devices and, uh, and how that was all the rage coming out what, uh, probably eight, nine months ago. And then, and then it felt like everybody started pumping the brakes and, and saying, well, wait a minute, is this stuff really working? Uh, how well does it work? Uh, it certainly can't be used for medical purposes. And, uh, uh, and then obviously questions of HIPAA and all those things kind of came into the fold. Um, so I, I still think, you know, video, video analytics, uh, maybe even machine learning. I think all those types of technologies are going to play a pretty important role moving forward coming out of this. Uh, and I think they got accelerated because of this to a certain extent. So I see those areas growing pretty significantly as well. Yeah, to your point about wearables, I've seen a lot of companies come out with um, uh, sort of wristwatches or bracelets or necklaces or something um, that enforces social distancing. 
So if you get too close to someone, it buzzes or it sends some signal somewhere. Uh, or for de-densification, you know, or for um, sort of occupancy tracking. So you can see, yeah. you know, when you can, you can use space more efficiently and things like that. So, yeah, I, I agree. And, and certainly with that, the temperature screening, there's, you know, there's all sorts of issues with that. I think it, it's more, um, I mean, some of the stuff is pretty good, but I think it's more, you know, for, for optics than yeah. for anything else. Like, okay, we're doing something, you know, it, it may help. So it's better yeah. than nothing. But Yeah, I think, I, I, I think the analytics side too, uh, we're, I think we'll become quickly a touchless society to the extent that we can. So where if I can walk up to a, a, a gate, uh, so to speak, or a turnstile of some some sort, not have to take a card out, not have to touch the machine, not have to use a fingerprint, but it sees my face and knows who I am and releases me in. Uh, those those are the type of things we're going to see probably uh, grow. Uh, you, you saw a lot of grocery stores uh, uh, and even the uh, the, the uh, home improvement stores uh, expand their uh, cashless uh, uh, activity, but also create more aisles of uh, self-checkout. Uh, and so, you know, uh, credit cards now are becoming, you know, rather than sliding them in and out of a, of a credit card reader, they're becoming touchless. So I think that'll be interesting as well as we go, go forward. I'm glad you brought that up because you're right with facial recognition and touchless fingerprints and other and, and, and so other technologies. The move is towards touchless, frictionless, whatever you want to call it. But in a lot of cases, especially if you're talking, you know, you're going from one office area to another, you're not going through optical turnstiles. You're going through a door. And in a lot of cases, you've got to touch that door. Even if you use your face, you got to turn a handle or maybe you can push the door, but then you got to push the door from two ways, you know, does it, um, or you have a foot pedal. So I haven't seen like a really, or, or you have an automatic door, but then people can tailgate behind you. So I haven't That's seen right. a really great, um, you know, response to like, how do you deal with that? I mean, you could put, you know, you could put um, Purell on both sides of the door and you have to touch it, but then it sort of takes, so then why do you bother having touchless if you have to touch something? So what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, Frankly, I think that's an area that we could see more innovation in, right? How can we get through uh, even a bathroom door without, you know, touching the handle or having to push uh, one way or the other to get in or out? Um, uh, we certainly have some pretty uh, substantial players in our space that are in door hardware uh, and and uh, 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 actual door uh, openings. So be interesting to see what they come up with uh, in the near future as kind of this touchless society begins to expand. Is that where you see, um, is that where your, your integrators who are members, what are they most excited about or what are they getting more requests for? So it's interesting. I, I think, I think top of the list is still video surveillance. Um, I think, uh, you know, it continues to drive a, a big part of their business, um, especially in the into commercial settings um, and uh, small to medium sized businesses. I think uh, uh, probably right after that is fire. Uh, you know, fire is such a code driven uh, discipline that, uh, you know, and, and uh, regulated. Uh, at, at the local and state level to the extent that it requires professional installation um, and certainly a, a deep knowledge of the codes and, and life safety standards. Uh, certainly access control is still growing um, and then intrusion probably follows that. So I would say video uh, and probably out of video is the analytics of it, right? It's no longer Oh, gosh, I can remember when I first got in the industry, we'd sell a video system and yeah, it was for security. And then we'd talk about, well, think about the advantage if somebody slips and falls in your business, you've got it recorded. And if, if they try to litigate, then you've got proof that they didn't really slip and fall. Maybe all they did was kneel down and, and lay on the floor. And, and so to think about where that's come today and the analytics that we're using now, uh, 
for video surveillance, not just for security. I mean, it's for marketing, it's for purchasing, uh, buying habits. It's, uh, it's for everything you can think of, uh, including gaining access to certain areas and, and, uh, understanding who's in your store and, and, uh, how long they're in there. So, uh, a video, I think is just a, an area that's going to continue to evolve and innovate, uh, uh, as we go forward. It'll be interesting to see how much of that innovation may get, uh, stonewalled a bit, uh, through legislation and, uh, uh, data privacy issues and things of that nature. But certainly right now it's, it's a growing segment of our industry. Now, I hear guys like, um, Leo Des, who hosts my show, by the way. So, uh, which I appreciate talking about software, like eating up, you know, traditional access control or, or just security companies, big software companies. And, um, on the, by the same token, um, there are other industry leaders who talk about prop tech sort of eating up video or access control and making that just making those functions just one feature of a bigger prop tech solution. So it might be, okay, temperature controls, uh, room scheduling, delivery scheduling, um, wayfinding, and access control. Uh, do you see that? in your area or is it still pretty much in, because it's, it's a trend both, as I understand it, in both commercial and in, in the home, um, uh, home security. So yeah. what do you see? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, the, as, as software in our industry has evolved and become a big part of how we're interacting with these systems, it's only a matter of time before Silicon Valley, you know, steps in and, and disrupts, uh, what traditional access control is today and what it, it'll become tomorrow. I mean, we hear, uh, a lot of conversations and, and certainly see, uh, products now that, uh, that are controlling access without any boxes at all in the field. It's all through software. Um, I think, uh, I think that will certainly continue to evolve. And I think, uh, our integrators will have to evolve along with it um, because there, there will always, you know, traditionally when, when you're installing an access control system, there, there chances are there's already an intrusion system. There's a fire alarm system. There, there's likely a video surveillance system. And the key uh, to really uh, take advantage of all of these systems is, is for them to be integrated together and talking to each other. So that's a that's going to be a key aspect in my view. Even though access control may become uh, software totally software driven, somehow it's still got to release the doors when the fire alarm system goes off. It still has to uh, you know zoom in on a on a, a video shot when an alarm or a door goes into alarm or somebody gains entry un in an unauthorized situation. Uh, I think so. That's going to be important. But absolutely, I, I see. Uh, innovation, I see disruption uh, continuing in, in those areas, especially in the access control area. Now, you've led me beautifully to my final question, which is about integration, but also integration writ large with uh, uh, cyber security. Uh, and are you, you, most of your members presumably at least start physical security integration, but there's a demand uh, for convergence, you know, integration, convergence of departments, convergence of physical and cyber security. Are your members, so I kind of call that digital transformation for short in our field. Are your members being asked to do that? Or are they embracing it? And is ESA helping them along that path? So we, we, from ESA's perspective, we have, uh, especially when it comes to some of our events, uh, like Leadership Summit, which is a very small uh, uh, summit that we put on for a couple of hundred integrators, uh, as well as ESX, we have a, a pretty heavy focus on cybersecurity. We like bringing in speakers and experts in this area. Uh, it's, it's an area that our members are starting to pay more and more attention to. They have for some time, uh, in terms of them 
offering cybersecurity as a service, we see a, a bit of a mixed bag. We've seen a handful of companies uh, either build out departments and services uh, with the, that kind of expertise. We've seen some acquire cyber companies uh, and, and, and fold them under the umbrella of, of their physical security uh, 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 offering as well. I think the vast majority of our integrators right now would are trying to stay in their lane of expertise. And so where and when there's a need, they're gonna outsource that, or they're gonna partner with a, a professional company that understands it. Um, they're gonna have uh, you know, conversations with their customers to make sure everyone understands where, uh, where, where their uh, uh, service ends, starts and ends in terms of, of cyber and where it's the responsibility of the end user to, to maybe take it uh, from, from that point forward. So I think right now, because cybersecurity is a, it's a big, big issue, certainly uh, not just for our industry, but globally, um, it's important uh, for our members to, to, to kind of stay in their lane and let those that are experts in the cybersecurity field kind of take the lead. Not to say that we won't continue to to make strides in, in that area or they won't continue to make strides, but uh, it's important to know what your strengths are and your weaknesses, right? Uh, uh, in terms of digital transformation, um, I do see our members uh, engaging more and more in uh, leveraging data and analytics about their customers and their customers' buying habits. Um, I think uh, some of them are trying to use that as differentiators uh, to their competition. I see them investing in uh, digital transformation strategies and deploying uh, new ERP type systems um, so that they have uh, a, a deeper uh, insight into some of the analytics of their customers. And, and, uh, and so I, I, I see that. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of them are hosting customer facing type applications. Uh, you know, we see uh, 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 great innovation from uh, companies that are, are, are building out uh, user interfaces and apps for, for end users. So, uh, you know, I think th there's a lot of opportunity and growth in that, in that area as well for our, our membership. And certainly as uh, smart devices, uh, that are in homes become uh, more commercially acceptable and, and commercial grade uh, type devices. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where where smart businesses take us in the future. And that leaves us a great note. Thank you for your um, very sharp observations and, and um, very helpful insights. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you for being with us, Merlin. And, um, I hope your virtual show in June goes well. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate uh, your time today. My pleasure.